Hello, uh, thank you for joining a, a CIF webinar. Um, today we're joined by Michael Walsh of the Health and Safety Authority. Um, CIF is delighted uh, to partner with the Health and Safety Authority um, on the theme of uh, managing vehicle risks in construction. So this coincides with the um, Friday, the 26th of October, the theme for Construction Safety Week. Um, so Michael is going to run through a uh, presentation um, and will hopefully be of some assistance to you in providing the tools to manage construction risks on site. Thank you. As John said, my name is Michael Walsh. I'm from the Health and Safety Authority. I'm attached to the Transport Operations and Vehicle Risks Programme. And we're delighted in that unit that vehicle risks have been identified as one of the themes for uh, Construction Safety Week. And we're delighted to have this opportunity to um, highlight vehicle safety in construction. Uh, the title of today's seminar is Managing Vehicle Risks in Construction. And I'm going to look at this on a kind of a three-pronged approach. Vehicles on the sites themselves, the interface between the site and the public road, and then construction vehicles on the public road. So when we're talking about the site, we're talking about materials reception, materials dispatch, loading, unloading, parking, and I'm just talking about the parking of the vehicles associated with, with um, the people coming to the construction site. But then on the construction site itself, vehicle maneuvers, trucks and vans, deliveries, fuel deliveries, specialist construction vehicles, and they come in all shapes and sizes as we know. And then the possibility of deterior deteriorating roadways. And I suppose what I'm talking about there are um, excavations, where excavations are ongoing, a lot of uh, vehicle activity, and then as a result of that, roads deteriorate, and that brings itself with, it, with it, its own hazards. In terms of the site and the public road interface, I'm talking about vehicles entering and exiting the site. The possibility of vehicles queuing on the road outside, um, the possibility of vehicles having to reverse into the site. Roadway contamination, that can be an issue. I'll talk about examples of that later. Loading and unloading on the roadway itself, um, I'd like to think that, that could be avoided, but I accept that in some situations it can't. So if that's the situation, then it has to be planned. And then working on the roadway. Um, some activities on construction sites will mean you know, road realignment or bringing services in. So they'll, they'll be working on the roadway outside of the, the, the site. And again, we're talking about parking. Sometimes um, working on a construction site brings a, a volume of parking that has to be distributed around the local area. And we're also talking about the visibility of the site in relation to other vehicles that are on the road and passing by the site, passing by the entrance to the site. In terms of on the road itself, I'll be talking a little bit later on about driving for work, um, particularly in relation to uh, large construction vehicles that um, by the very fact of, 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 their, of their activity have to be on the public road. But I'm also going to be talking a little bit about, and I want to draw attention to the Great Fleet. You know, people, the part of vehicles that we don't possibly think about associated with construction activity, but it does have to happen. People do have to drive from place to place, sometimes in their own cars. Um, but that means that they're driving for work on the road and we'll be talking about that. Uh, working on or near the road, a lot of construction activity, and I'm not talking about roadworks here, obviously that's one of them, but things like drainage and services, that's the construction work that takes place on or near the road and you have the interface there between um, the work activities and, and the other road users. Loading and unloading, that, as we said before, and vehicle man maneuvers on the public road. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the interaction between construction vehicles and other vulnerable road users, or VRUs for short, and we'll go into that a little bit later. So we're talking about trucks, vans, specialised vehicles here on the, on the public road, and the Great Fleet, and we'll go into that as we're going along. Um, to start with, I suppose we'll start with the bad news. Um, vehicles do cause accidents. So I'll be talking a little bit about the fatals and non-fatals that are reported to the HSA. Um, we break that down into the fatals and non-fatals in construction and the typical kind of accidents that, that recur uh, and the reason why we're putting a profile on vehicles in, in this uh, Construction Safety Week. And then I'll talk a little bit also about work-related road collision profile in relation to construction vehicles on the public road. So this first infographic is um, all the work-related vehicle deaths that have been reported to the Health and Safety Authority between 2009 and 2015. And the first thing I'll draw your attention to there is the, the bottom left-hand corner you'll see that construction uh, is the second largest um, contributor there with 18 deaths over that period. So that's, that's the, the significant um, feature in that particular infographic. Breaking it down, that, that previous infographic was all 
vehicle related accidents. So we know the vehicles are, are dangerous right across the board. But breaking it down into the construction sector, um, this uh, infographic uh, extends out a little bit farther. It goes up to 2017. So the number has gone up to 20 here for construction. Again, the second highest. And you can see there from the infographic, the different types of vehicles that are involved. So a wide range of vehicles, um, cars, excavators, tipper trucks, forklifts, um, trucks with trailers, teleporters, mupes, um, cranes, uh, one tractor there, and uh, a kind of a tow vehicle. So these are the, the um, fatal accidents that we know have happened, uh, 20 of them out of the total of, uh, of 68. Um, so vehicles are a very significant risk that have to be addressed. I suppose this slide is last year's one um, to add to the, to, the, to the previous two, this infographic. And, uh, and I suppose the good news here is that in 2017, there was only one construction vehicle related accident. And similarly for 2018, only one so far this year. Uh, as far as I recall, that was a trailer unloading a trailer at a site and, and the load to top on top of the, 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 the victim. Um, the next three slides are courtesy of the Road Safety Authority and their data. Um, they're co um, constantly feeding us with this, with, with this information. Um, and the, the significant part about these three slides is that large vehicles and vans constitute a significant proportion of the fatal accidents that occur on the road. Now, I'm not saying they're all construction because we don't have that specialist or that specific data yet, but safe to say that if it's large trucks and if it's vans, a, a certain proportion of those are construction related and they're on the road because of construction related activities. Um, the same for serious collisions and for minor collisions. Again, large trucks and uh, vans and specialist vehicles take up a large proportion. But even if we're talking about cars, and we know cars are, 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 seven, are a serious proportion, you have to remember, we don't have the information here, but it's safe to say that some of those cars are on the road because of work-related activities. We don't know the proportion. So getting back to construction and construction-related harm in, in, in um, vehicles, construction is the second highest rate of vehicle-related deaths. We saw that from the previous two infographics. Um, according to the HSA statistics accidents reported to us, it's the fourth highest rate of work-related injuries. Now, you might say second highest rate of deaths and fourth highest rate of injuries. How is that? I would say it's because we know that all the injuries aren't being reported to the Health and Safety Authority. But of the figures that we do have, it's construction and work-related vehicles are, is the fourth highest rate. So the bottom line here is that vehicles are very significant in terms of causing death and injury uh, to, to construction workers and construction-related activities. Um, what vehicles are most likely to be involved in work-related deaths? Well, trucks and vans, as we saw, but also the specialized construction um, vehicles like site dumpers, mutes, teleporters that we saw on that previous infographic. So the main killers, how are people being killed? Well, the obvious one is people, and this is borne out by the, by the statistics, people being struck by vehicles. That's the, that's the highest killer. And then probably the second highest killer, and bear in mind, we don't have all the data on this yet, uh, so this could change, but the second highest is work-related road collisions. Then it's followed by people falling from vehicles, um, vehicles impacting something else and overturning, and possibly the driver getting killed, and then loads falling from vehicles. And uh, one of the, the, the accidents that we had this year is, is, is of that last category there. In terms of the injuries that happen, um, again, people being struck by vehicle is the highest one, and they're probably lucky to get away with an injury and not be killed. And um, if lucky is probably the wrong word to use there, but um, because when you get struck by a vehicle, it tends to be very, very serious. Um, the second one is physical strain. Um, just people getting, getting injured because of, of um, working associated with vehicles, maybe um, moving materials. The third one is slips, trips and falls. This is a very significant one. People just slipping off vehicles, falling from vehicles. We saw that it contributes to, to fatal accidents. It also contributes to injuries. And then items falling onto people. Um, you saw in both of those um, last two slides, items falling onto people, um, off vehicles, falling from vehicles, that's probably to do with load securing and we we'll talk a little bit about that as we go on. So what activities as a result of all that need to be better managed? These are break down into three main points, reversing and slow speed maneuvers, 
entering and exiting sites, and then loading and unloading vehicles on the site or on the roadway. Being from the Health and Safety Authority, we're going to start off with the legal imperative. So, as you'd be familiar, this is all covered under the Safety, Health and Welfare Work Act. And that places a duty of, of in care on, on the employer. And in terms of vehicles, that's a safe place of work. And remember that vehicles are places of work. Safe systems of work, how we use those vehicles. Access and control risks. So that means we have to risk assess our vehicle activities. And we put in place then policies and procedures in terms of how we're going to use those, those vehicles, how we're going to manage those vehicles. We follow that up with information, uh, instruction and training. So those are the people that are using the vehicles and also the people that are in and around those vehicles. And the Safety, Health and Welfare Work Act talks about safe work and, uh, and equipment. And again, a vehicle comes under that heading. So a vehicle has to be safe, it has to be safe to be used properly, and it has to be safe for use. But there's also a duty of care on, on, on the employee. Uh, and that means that when an employee is uh, given a vehicle or has a vehicle for use of work, that they work safely with that, that they use it safely in a safe manner. So we're talking about a safe systems approach. As, as I said in the previous slide, it's covered by occupational safety and health legislation. To a certain extent, it's also covered by road safety legislation under the Road Traffic Act and regulations under that that are enforced by the Gardaí. But in terms of employers and the, the occupational safety and health obligation, it's an obligation to provide safe vehicles. So they must be safe, suitable and fit for purpose and for every journey that they want to be used for. Safe drivers. So that means managing and monitoring driver behavior. Safe operations. So that when we are using vehicles, that, that they're being used safely. So that in terms of uh, reversing, parking, loading, and unloading. And we go into that in a little bit more detail as we go on. And safe journeys, optimizing the interaction with the other road users, planning journeys. And again, we go into, into that. And uh, so there is a duty on, a, on an employers, but as I said earlier, there's also a duty on a, in, in employees. So why do vehicle accidents happen? So we have a list of, of reasons here on the slide. Uh, the first one is lack of management control. So people didn't think about it. They just had the vehicle put into operation and possibly hope for the best. That can't work. It has to be managed. It has to be controlled. Lack of safe systems of work for vehicle operations. So that means you have to think about the vehicle operations and put in place safe systems. And hopefully that if those safe systems are adhered to, well then um, accidents will be prevented. Lack of awareness. And that's both on the part of everybody the people managing the situation, the people driving the vehicles, and people in and around the vehicles. The awareness that, the, that these vehicles are inherently dangerous and being associated or near them is inherently dangerous. That might mean lack of training for the drivers, for the people in and around, and we'll talk about that as we go along. Also, and we can't forget this, deliberate unsafe acts. And I don't mean people doing safe, unsafe acts deliberately, but doing it uh, because, just because they want to hurt themselves, but to do an unsafe act in a deliberate fashion that causes a, a dangerous situation. Um, they, they do something that they know they shouldn't probably have done. Um, and here I'm spot possibly talking about the killer behaviors like going too fast, um, using a vehicle under the influence of intoxicants, um, using a vehicle when there's other distractions going on uh, around them, uh, like th that they bring into the situation themselves, like mobile phones and that sort of thing, um, or eating or when, when, when they are operating the vehicle, or maybe operating the vehicle when they're fatigued or tired and knowing that they probably shouldn't be driving this. And then simply the, the old um, bugbearer of not wearing our safety belts. And again, I'm not talking about cars, but cars are relevant here, but also on sites, vehicle, a lot of the vehicles are supplied with safety belts for a good reason. So if you're in that um, particular vehicle, you should be wearing your safety belts and people still aren't. So that's why um, when I talk about deliberate unsafe acts, why vehicle accidents happen. So what have we to do to try to prevent all those, those type of accidents that we know are happening and making vehicles the, um, the second highest killer in construction? So you have to consider all the activities in the workplace and develop procedures and rules specific to that business and to the working environment and to the kind of work that you're doing. Procedures should be in place that clearly outline how, where, and when vehicles are being used and involving who and um, related vehicle activities that are going to be carried out, including the driving, deliveries and collections, loading and unloading, and also I'm talking about here, not overloading vehicles. Uh, we, we know that 
for example, in um, earth moving situations, that uh, contractors are being put under pressure to take bigger loads than they know is safe and, and is safe for, for the um, for the vehicle to use, and also breaking road traffic legislation by overloading the vehicle. Um, we're talking about the old bugbears of reversing. Um, parking, simple things like parking, how it can be done safely. And then the slow speed maneuvers and maneuvering. We know from the accident statistics that these are the kind of things that are causing the accidents. Um, coupling and uncoupling. And some of the procedures that we need to put in place are simple things like vehicle checks and maintenance, making sure that, that vehicles are properly maintained and uh, regularly serviced, but also that the driver checks the vehicles on a routine basis just to make sure that they're in good condition, because we all know deterioration happens. So starting off with the first one, deliveries and collections. We know this is essential to the business, to the construction, but it can be some of the most dangerous activities that the staff have to deal with. And many delivery and collection incidents could be prevented if there was better cooperation between all the parties involved. And what I'm saying there is that it just doesn't start at the site. It starts way before the site when this delivery is being organized and planned. You're ringing up, you're saying, right, I want this delivered on such and such a date, but I also want it done safely. So it starts planning at that stage so that it doesn't just end up that a vehicle beauty lorry ends up at the site of, of, of the gate and nobody knows what to do with it. And as a result of um, people kind of deciding themselves what's what the best thing, an accident might happen. Whereas if that activity was planned and everybody took their joint responsibility in planning that, then the accident wouldn't happen. Because individuals, mostly drivers, are often unfairly blamed for those type of accidents and they could be prevented if all the duty holders had cooperated and uh, planned the, the thing accordingly. So in terms of delivery, there are three duty holders, the supplier, the person sending the goods, the carrier, which is the, the, the haulier, the person that, and the driver is usually working for them, and then the recipient, which is the, the construction site itself, the people, the people receiving the, the goods on the site. So there's a joint responsibility by, by all three there, and they have to work together to make sure that that delivery is done safely. In terms of the site itself, loading and delivery areas should be um, prioritized. There should be de designated areas on the site if possible. Now, I accept that that's not always possible because some sites are very restricted in terms of access and all that kind of stuff. But if there is possibility for um, a designated loading and loading, uh, unloading area on the site, well, then that should be put in place. There should be clear instructions for visiting drivers so that when they do arrive, that they know exactly what they're doing and they're not wandering around wondering what should they do next. Um, clear ground markings and clear signs if you do have the, the designated area and authorized personal, personnel on the site only. A very good idea is to have a site liaison person, somebody that's going, going to meet every load that is delivered um, so that the, that kind of um, um, instructions for the visiting drivers is, is, is set up properly. And then if there is a designated loading and unloading area, it, that it should be well lit because as we all know, we're coming into the winter now and uh, deliveries early in the morning and, and later in the evening will be done in darkness. So um, it's, it's important that that area is lit so, so that the, the loading and unloading can be conducted safely. I just want to pay particular attention to lorry loader cranes and incidents involving lorry loader cranes because these are used very frequently and even becoming more, more frequent now uh, as these um, pieces of equipment are, are getting more prolific. Um, but very useful pieces of equipment, but they also cause accidents um, due to vehicle instability because it's too easy to overload the, the, the um, vehicle because you have this very handy crane. Um, also, you can uh, lose the load either off the vehicle itself or off the, 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 the crane when, when you're using it because of whatever um, sling failure or overloading. Failure of the crane itself or the attachments are, are, are lifting accessories, as I said, slings. Overturning of the whole lot because um, these things usually come without rigors and uh, that usually means that you have to assess the ground to make sure that it's capable of taking the loads that are imposed by those outriggers. Uh, so the inability of the ground to take the loads can, can, can cause an over, overturning. Our failure to use correct um, stabilizers or spreader plates if, if you do think the ground is, is a little bit um, suspect. Um, and then obviously, because if you have a crane and you have um, maneuverability with it, it can strike pedestrians, other vehicles, and overhead power lines. They're, they're, the, they're the classic um, types of accidents that happen with um, lorry loader cranes. Um, 
a point that I want to draw attention to here is the legal requirements regarding lorry loader cranes. They are a crane. So like all the other cranes that we have on construction sites, the tower cranes and the, uh, the mobile cranes, they're a crane and they must be thoroughly examined by a competent person every 12 months. It's the exact same legislation, so the exact same legis legislation uh, applies. So that lorry loader crane that comes on the back of, the, of, of a truck must be accompanied by a report of thorough examination. And also I need the lifting equipment and the lifting accessories. Exa again, exactly the same as uh, all the other construction type cranes. That should be thoroughly examined every six months and marked with safe working load. And it must also be examined and tested after any alteration or repair before it's put back into, into service. And the people that are operating it is a piece of work equipment. And so people need to be trained to use the work equipment properly. And that training should cover things like the controls, instruments, working load limits, load assessments and load charts, the awareness of the environment, ground conditions, obstacles, all that kind of stuff. Um, the safe working procedures for slinging and lifting, because again, it's a very significant and, 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 and uh, potentially hazardous activity. So the need to know how to do it properly, including hand signals um, and the operation limitations for each type of crane and the accessory that they, that, that they operate. And similar to all vehicles, the, the, the operator should be um, trained to do in-service checks. In other words, just to, to do routine checks um, to know that things are not maybe as they should be and to, if, they, if they feel that that is the case to report them. Um, just to draw your attention that we do have in the Health and Safety Authority um, a safe lorry loader crane operations information sheet and that can be accessed through the, the, the link on the, uh, on the slide there. So if lorry loader cranes are part of, of your um, work activities and you want to know how to, how to um, adequately manage them, I'd advise you go to that particular um, link. And we'll be going through these as we're going through the, uh, the rest of the presentation. So that takes me on to load securing. Um, another uh, cause of accidents, and it is estimated that up to 25% of accidents involving trucks on the road can be attributable to inadequate car cargo securing. Now, I'm not saying all construction, but just all trucks generally on the road. 25% uh, of accidents involving those can be attributable to in inadequate car cargo securing. Um, and the reason for that is because it's easy to assume that if a load is heavy or, or if it's very light, well, then it's not going to go anywhere. It's just going to sit there, particularly the heavy loads. The, the, the myth is that if you put a heavy load on the back of a truck and just sit it there, the weight will hold it there. That's a myth. That is wrong. Uh, the simple fact of the matter is that during transport, and we're all aware of this when we're driving in our cars, we know that if we're driving in our cars, we put, our, in our, put on our seatbelts. What are we actually doing? We're actually securing ourselves as a load. You have to do the same, that, same as that with cargo. So during transport, all cargo items have to be presented from sliding, tipping, rolling, or wandering or any kind of de de deformation or rotation in any direction in the truck or on the bed of the truck. And we do that by methods such as locking, blocking, direct lashing or over the top lashing or a combination of all of these. Now, load securing in construction is, is a big issue and there are lots of typical risks found in uh, load securing in construction like structural steel and, and steel wire. These are kind of unusual loads as well, for, for load securing. They're a little bit harder to secure. Uh, Precast concrete, side cabins and prefab accommodation, plant and machinery, a lot of that. So again, big heavy plant, and you think if you drive it up in the back of a, of, of a low loader, it's heavy, it's gonna stay there. No, it has to be secured. Concrete blocks is a, is a, is a particular one. Um, and again, because they're heavy and they're kind of um, regular shape, people think that if you just put them on the back of a truck, they'll sit there, they won't. Uh, timber and timber formwork, cable drums, scaffolding. Scaffolding is a classic one. Um, you put scaffolding on stillages sometimes and then you lift it onto the back of the truck and then you tie down the stillage. But the scaffolding is not tied to the stillage. So that can be an issue. The load is actually not secure there. The stillages are secure, but the load is not secure. Uh, similarly, roofing materials, particularly sheeting materials, pipes. And when we're talking about load securing, I'm also going to mention overloaded loads again. You know, um, excavation, excavations um, that you're, where your earth's moving, it's too easy to overload those and part of that load won't be secure. So in relation to load securing, here are some examples taken by both the Gardaí and some by our own inspectors, the association of the Gardaí. Um, Health and Safety Authority inspectors can't stop vehicles on the road, but we can um, do roadside inspections in conjunction with the guards. And here are some of the things we found. So up on the bottom left or on the top left hand corner there, you have the van, the typical van, and it has a kind of a roof cage on with all the materials in there. But just because it's contained inside the cage doesn't mean that it's secure. I mean, those things can come out over the top if they're not tied, which they're, they're not in this case. So 
it's just grabbing this hole in that there, but and it's just um, it, 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 it's 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 an accident waiting to happen, probably to the to the, the vehicles behind. Um, the middle top one there is um, an unusual con kind of construction type uh, load. It's a, a, a mixture of materials. Probably, in fairness, one that is difficult to secure, but um, you'll see that there is, um, particularly at the front there, there's some pieces of material that aren't secure at all. The next one is a curtain cider, and it has the stillages, which as I mentioned, like in the scaffolding example I said earlier, the stillages are secured, but the material on the stillages isn't. Um, bottom left-hand corner there, I've been assured by the colleague that took that picture that that's, it, it doesn't look like a construction related one, but it actually is because those bags are full of sand. And, and again, this is the curtain cider where the, the bags of sand were lifted up on, on pallets and just put into the curtain cider and the curtain cider closed. Um, but those um, um, bags are not secured inside in, in, that, um, in, in that vehicle, in that body of that trailer. Um, the classic one there of the two skips on the, uh, on the, the, the skip truck, um, it wasn't designed for that. It's not intended to be used like that. That load is not secure. And then the other two uh, photographs are where people have made efforts to secure the load, but again, it's not done properly because uh, in the first one there, you can see that the, the hook is just hooked under the, the, uh, the kind of the edge of the, um, of the body of the shirt, and that hook is going to slip. Um, slings and hooks have to be attached to a, to a proper um, proprietary um, hook attachment point on the trailer. And the other one then is the sling that is tied together. I mean, that's a, an absolute classic no-no. Um, if a sling is damaged in any way, it shouldn't be used at all. Certainly not tied and, and, and reused. So load securing, um, this is an activity that the Health and Safety Authority are involved in partnership with the Garda Síochána and the Road Safety Authority. And between the three agencies, we have developed um, a lot of information in terms of securing loads and a lot of information that is relevant to the construction industry. So the first load securing information sheet there is the basics. Uh, of load securing, as you'll see, that the, the three agencies' logos are on it, and they can be accessed at the link that's on the on the um, on the website. But um, there are other ones specific to construction sites um, for specific loads, and we have here uh, precast concrete loads and also the uh, securing of structural steel loads, which are difficult to secure, so it's important that they're done correctly. And also the, the securing of planting machinery, we all know that that's moved around quite a bit, and the um, safe loads, securing of side cabins, which are kind of awkward loads. All these information sheets can be accessed through uh, loadsafe.ie, www.loadsafe.ie. And if you go in on there, there's uh, an abundance of, of uh, guidance to help you. If, you. if you know you have load securing issues and you want to know how to do it properly, uh, you, you'll certainly find the information there. The next item I want to talk about is parking, the parking associated with construction activities. Um, if possible, Parking should be, um, a parking area should, should be um, provided on the site so that um, there's minimum disruption to, to, to the areas around the site. And it should, should be suitable and sufficient for all the work and for the private vehicles that are coming to that site. It should be arranged to avoid crossing traffic routes. In other words, um, if you are going to provide parking, you don't want to provide it uh, on the other side of where you know all the people are going to have to walk across where the, 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 the actual site traffic is going in and out, the, lar the large trucks, the large um, delivery vehicles. Um, there should be assigned delivery and collection areas, as I said earlier. Uh, parking areas should be well lit, lit and signposted, and if possible, adopt a reverse in and drive out rule. Um, that rule in itself, very, very simple thing to, to put in place, doesn't cost anything. Um, but it is proven to, um, to, to reduce risk significantly in terms of, of parking. And then we go on to safe workplace design and layout. And this is the design and layout of the, the site itself. So your vehicle management system needs to be right for the vehicles on the site itself and for ve visiting vehicles. So that means entrance gates and gateways need to be wide enough. If possible, put a banksman on duty. Traffic routes should be clearly marked and controlled. Pedestrian walkways, where they cross vehicle routes, they should be clearly marked and controlled. Put in place a one-way system where, where possible and where necessary. Now, I accept that that might not always be possible, but if it is, put it in place because it reduces the, the need for turning and it eliminates reversing. Um, if turning and reversing is required, well, then we put in place reversing areas. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. 
And then to supplement all that, put in place workplace signs, you know, one-way systems show the drivers which way to go, sensible speed limits, wheel stops, anywhere where reversing does take place, simple um, physical barriers to stop people over reversing. And similar, similarly, where there's overhead power lines, the overhead um, line barriers there. In terms of reverse, reversing vehicles, where possible, as I said, remove the need for reversing of trucks and vans and by putting in place a one-way system. Um, if that's not possible, identify and mark reversing areas. In other words, the vehicles go to that area and that's where they turn and reverse. So that area can then be controlled. You exclude non-essential personnel from those areas. If necessary, put a banksman in place at that area to assist with the reversing and to keep people out of that area and then install stop blocks and buffers to prevent vehicles over reversing. Vehicles that do reverse um, where possible should be um, augmented to the highest extent with reversing aids like mirrors and um, cameras and that kind of thing. Pedestrian movement then is the next big issue that needs to be um, controlled. So uh, the main hazard here would be um, visitors because they have no appreciation of the rules of the site. So it's very important to control visitor ent entry and visitors should be accompanied by somebody at all times when they're on the site. Uh, in terms of uh, general pedestrian movement, there should be separate routes for pedestrians and workers and then put in bar place barriers or rails at entrances and exits. And as I said earlier, probably a separate um, pedestrian entrance and where uh, pedestrian crossings cross over heavy traffic routes uh, proprietary crossing should be put in place there so that people know that that's where you cross the route and that the drivers are also aware that the vehicle or the pedestrians will be used in that area. All people on site should have high visibility um, PPE and we know the importance that that is in terms of, of the driver's appreciation of where people are. But more importantly, pedestrian and pedestrian workers need to be made aware of the driver's restricted visibility and to understand blind spots. And this sh should be a significant part of tool back, toolbox talk, um, talks and things like that, because there's only so much the driver can do uh, and they certainly can't see people in and around them. So those people need to be made aware of that fact that the driver can't see them. So this slide here just shows a typical um, tipper truck and all those people in, the, in that image, the driver can't see them, uh, even with, 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 the, um, with the aids that, that's, that are on the truck, the driver can't see those people. So pedestrians on the ground, in and around vehicles need to be made aware of that. Similarly with all other types of construction vehicles, blind spots is a huge issue. Uh, and the, the, the people, the pedestrian workers and, and other pedestrians need to be made aware of that. In the Health and Safety Authority, we have resources um, to help people manage that kind of thing. And here's one information sheet uh, entitled Pedestrian Safety in the Workplace, and it's available at that link on the slide. The other issue I made, mentioned earlier is the whole issue of people falling from and slipping from vehicles, um, usually resulting in um, non-fatal accidents, but nevertheless can be quite serious. So uh, this is an information sheet called Watch Your Step. It's, it's, it's um, entirely about preventing slips, trips and falls from vehicles. And it's available at that um, link on the, on the, on the, on the um, slide there. But the, the, the small uh, the basic principles there are open the door, check the floor, check the, the, the footwear and check the surfaces, uh, particularly if they're going to be uh, slippery when, when they become wet. Other resources that we have available for help, helping people um, manage pedestrian safety and worker safety on sites in, in, in relation to vehicles is um, some of those um, information sheets there that are available on, at those links. That then takes me to the whole issue of driving for work. And here we're moving away from the site and onto the public road. Um, drivers of company cars and heavy uh, commercial vehicles are more likely to be at um, risk and to be at fault when driving incidents occurs. And we know this from, from data that we, that we get from, from the Road Safety Authority and, and on Garda Shea Kona. And it's due to a number of factors. It's not just due to the driving skills and attitudes. It's more down to the fact that driving for work involves specific risks. Um, sometimes because of the types of vehicles that are being driven, um, large vehicles, uh, as we saw with, with restricted access, but also it's down to the amount of time spent behind the wheel. Um, because the greater the amount of time, the greater the exposure and therefore the, the greater um, exposure to risks. So driving for work is uh, a legal requirement. Uh, it comes under the Safety, Health and Welfare Work, uh, work Act because driving for work uh, is, is a work activity in the same way as all other work activities are. And employers 
should have a safety management system in place for managing um, all work-related risks, and that includes the driving for work risks. So start by uh, making sure that drivers are legally entitled to drive the vehicle that they're using. They're using a vehicle that is safe and roadworthy. Um, that they're trained and competent and fit to drive that vehicle. And by fit, I mean, you know, fit in terms of they don't have um, reasons not to drive because of, we say, fatigue or intoxicants or something like that. And, and that they're actually using their vehicle safely um, and that they're not getting um, distracted, we say, by using technology or eating in, in the vehicle while they're driving. There's an interaction between um, large construction vehicles and vulnerable road users that needs to be managed. It needs to be appreciated and it needs to be managed um, because these two don't mix. So how do you manage the interaction between trucks and uh, vulnerable road users? Well, drivers need to have an understanding of their responsibility to protect those uh, road users. So that means um, giving them clear instructions that they have to slow down at bends and brows of hills and in built up areas so that they're not under pressure to deliver and they're not under pressure to, to, to get there faster. Um, that they're given training uh, in, in, in increased observation skills so that at junctions they're able to watch out for vulnerable users, uh, pedestrians at pedestrian crossings, um, cyclists, that kind of thing. And then you can use the latest available technology to minimize blind spots, so that's cameras and mirrors. But also things like um, monitoring the drive speed, the driver's speed to ensure the drivers are not putting themselves and others at risk. Or, or, or their, their style of driving. Um, and here I'm talking about telematics and things like that. Um, but also in terms of the overall planning, journeys and routes can be planned to avoid where these vulnerable road users might be. Places like town centers, residential areas, schools, parks, all that kind of stuff. So in other words, you're, no, you're gonna have a site, you're gonna have a vehicle activity related to that site, but you're gonna plan your journeys and your routes to minimize the uh, interaction now, you're not going to be able to cut it out completely, but you will be able to minimize it. Some ideas here that people are using, uh, things like making the vehicles themselves more visible, um, putting reminder stickers in the cab so that the drivers know that this is the, the company policy and this is what they're expected to do. Um, you know, pass cyclists, giving them a wide berth, um, no distractions, no intoxicants, no eating in the cab, things like that. And then um, poster campaigns there like, you know, we are sharing the road, share the, the road safely together. Um, so that you're reinforcing the message, this is the company policy, this is how we expect um, from, from our drivers, this is how we expect the drivers to behave. And lastly, I want to refer to what we refer to as the grey fleet. The grey fleet is um, sometimes used to describe vehicles that don't belong to the company, but have been used for company um, use and for business travel. And they kind of include vehicles that may be purchased under an employee ownership scheme or a privately rented vehicle, or more commonly, a vehicle privately owned by the employee but used in the company business. And where the vehicle is driven on company business, usually in return for a cash allowance or a fuel expense or something like that, well, that vehicle is considered to be part of the great fleet and it thus it falls under the responsibility of the employer to manage that driving for work activity. So what you do there is you put in place a driving for work policy. Uh, here are there five key steps to, to implementing that policy. And the first one is to put the policy in place. Um, the second one then is to risk assess the hazards that are involved in the driving for work activity. Again, bear in mind that this is on the public road. This is away from the, the, the area where the employer necessarily has control, but they do have influence. So you put in place the, um, or you identify the hazards and then you put in place the control measures, the expected behaviors that you expect from that driver who is driving on behalf of that company for that period of time. Um, so you, and then you put those safe systems into place, you communicate it to the drivers, um, you reinforce the point that this is how you expect them to behave while they are driving on, on, um, on company uh, money or company expense. And uh, so these are the, the activities. But it, it's, it's simple things, it's simple procedures like you know, planning the journey to ensure that they have adequate time to do it so that they're not under pressure or they're not being forced to, to, to make up time in any way that if they do have to take calls or receive messages, that that's timed into the, the journey as well, so that they have to the, the pull into the side of the road or pull into a service station and take those calls, make those phone calls, uh, receive those messages, and then continue on the journey. That there's no time pressure. Um, similarly, in terms of fatigue, that there's not long, long, long journeys and that they're not expected to, to do it from one end to the other, that, that again, there, there is time built in to allow them to take, um, take a break. 
And then when you have those measures put into practice, you have to measure the performance, see how it's working, and then review the performance. That's the, they're the fundamentals of, of, a, of a good policy. Um, there's no point putting it in place unless you see how it's going to work and how it is operating, and if there's any improvements that can be made. Lastly, I want to finish up by acknowledging that there's a lot of information here. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that has to be managed. Um, but I just want to draw your attention to the fact that there's a lot of resources to help you in doing that. And the first one here is uh, the European Commission's um, vehicle safety site called VSAFE. It's available at that link on the website. Um, information there is based on experiences from all over Europe. So there's, a, there's a, a, an amount of information there that can be used. Secondly, I want to draw your attention to um, a portal called www.drivingforwork.ie. It's a, it's a joint initiative of the Health and Safety Authority in conjunction with the Angarda Siakona and the Road Safety Authority. And in terms of driving for work, this is the portal to use. Um, one of the um, resources in there is a, a driving for work handbook, My Responsibilities, available at that link on, on, the, um, on the, the slide, so that if driving for work is an issue, you just download that particular publication and uh, use that to instruct the, the drivers. I also want to draw your attention to online courses, and these can be used for um, in a variety of fashions. They can be used for toolbox talks. There are actual courses that are done online. Um, they can be used as a form of training uh, where the person can undertake the course and pass the course and get a certificate so they can prove that they have um, undertaken a form of training. Uh, and, and again, those courses are available at hsalearning.ie. There's a variety of them. They cover high-risk vehicle activities, safe vehicles, safe workplaces, and safe drivers and employees. So as I said, these can be used for the purpose of toolbox talks or for the purpose of a participant going in and actually taking, taking the course themselves, passing the course and receiving the certificate. And, and that can be used as a, as a proof of a form of training. Lastly, I want to finish up by making reference to the HSA's Vehicles at Work website. It's uh, called www.vehiclesatwork.ie. Uh, so you can go into it using that link, or you can go into it using the, the Health and Safety Authority homepage and then finding the Vehicles at Work tab on the, the, the tab banner line there. And on that website, you will find links to a, a huge amount of resources. And I would urge you to, um, if, you, if there are any, any issues that you think you have for, in and around driving for work or workplace transport or workplace vehicles, that you go to that website, and I'm sure Quite confident you'll find the answer that, that you need uh, because the help is available there uh, in terms of managing um, the risk that you have and I'm sure you will find it on that website. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope it has given you some uh, food for thought but more importantly I hope it has pointed you in directions where you will be able to get the information that you need to adequately manage your vehicle risks on your construction sites. Thank you.